Good afternoon. My name is Ron Sloan and uh, I work in academic affairs. I'm sorry I can't be with you this afternoon, but uh, you'll be glad to know I'm, I'm enjoying a whole day of meetings with uh, my colleagues. And um, But I, I truly wish I could be present and enjoy the outstanding lunch that no doubt you had, or at least some refreshments. My topic today is uh, maybe not the most riveting or romantic topic, but still could be important for our students. It's what's wrong with withdrawals. It's a lot of W's to get out. Uh, and, you know, it, it seems like, and I've done this myself, you're taking a class and for some reason or other it's just not going so well. So to avoid getting a, a bad grade that'll be on your transcript forever, you withdraw. And I've, I've done that, my wife's done that, um, many people do that, and I think it's something we've even encouraged students to do in, in years past. But given some of the rules that are related to financial aid, uh, it's a new day and we have to consider a new approach. I believe you'll have some items up in, uh, either in the screen or in a handout that you have. And this first slide I call the Snyder Scenario. And uh, the president has suggested, uh, here's a situation. A student takes 12 hours her first term. Very common. Uh, wonderful student, used to getting all A's in high school. Uh, but uh, because uh, we may be holding her to a different level of rigor, uh, or because the student's uh, busier due to other job commitments or family commitments. Uh, she's finding the work harder and the grades are not coming so easily. In fact, she may be getting C's uh, at the midterm. Uh, this could create a kind of identity problem for some students who've always built their self-esteem around what kind of grade they've received. And so this student doesn't want this uh, poor grade showing up on her transcript and decides, uh, now that I know what's going on, I'm going to withdraw from these courses and then uh, take a fresh start next semester. Well, she does this. And, okay, she comes to you. You happen to be her advisor, if you're an advisor, but let's say you are an advisor. What would you recommend that she do that next semester? Uh, one... Uh, the first option is she could focus on only six hours and so she'd really get the feel of college life, get the sense of what it takes to be successful at Ivy Tech, and then she could build on that in the future. Sounds like something I would recommend if uh, someone came to me. Um, or she should take retake all her courses uh, next semester while the content's fresh in her mind. That makes sense too because uh, she did it once, she did pretty well, and so it's just, it's just another crack at it, and that would really put her over the hump in her, in her mind. Or, number three, uh, she's taking a certain uh, course of study. Uh, let's say she's taking uh, music. That's a program we don't have here, but she's taking music, and she really wants to be in, in HVAC. So uh, she should just forget about all those courses and jump to HVAC fresh, courses and see if she really has more interest in that and her uh, HVAC apt aptitude and this new environment will uh, move her up to A's. Or uh, three, or excuse me, four, she should jump in the deep end and take even more hours next term. What would you recommend? Well, I think a, a strong case would be uh, one, two, or three, but probably not four. Uh, if she's taking a lot more hours, the fact that she wasn't successful with the 12 hours, uh, well, she, she shouldn't take, take that many. But we'd be wrong. Because of uh, the, the restrictions and the laws for financial aid. And so let's focus on those for a minute. Uh, financial aid recipients who withdraw or stop attending all classes before the 60% point in the term will owe money back to the federal government. So if she's withdrawn, she's going to owe money back. Uh, 
And so uh, that usually isn't something our students would like to have happen to them. Uh, and if they're on financial aid to begin with, it means they do have some financial limitations. So that could be a real jolt to her. So keep that in mind, that, that federal return of funds. That happens before the 60% period. So if, if she does anything, she should at least hang on uh, for the 60% period. However, let's say she hangs on to the 60% period, but uh, withdraws just before the last day withdraws. There's a very narrow window there of time. So she, she picks that time and she says, I'm going to withdraw because I won't have to give money back. But that doesn't mean there's no problems with that. Because the way we calculate uh, hours, and it's called, uh, well, two things here. There's called a maximum time frame. And all the attempted hours she takes are included in any, any calculation. So if she's withdrawn from 12 hours, those 12 hours don't disappear. They will stay there on her uh, calculation of total hours. And if she keeps taking hours, and let's, let's say she goes into HVAC, if the HVAC program is 60 hours, she can only take 150% of the number of hours that is in the, in the curriculum guide for that program. So if she reaches uh, 90 hours, she has used up all her financial aid and will be uh, terminated from financial aid, never to get any more. Uh, and, and by starting out in such a way, she's, she's far along the path of doing that. Now, it wouldn't kick in for a while, true, but that's where another problem kicks in. And it's this, students must complete 67% or more of the attempted courses that they take. This is the completion rate. So let's back to our, our student. She takes 12 hours. She withdraws from 12 hours. Okay, next semester, how can she, how many hours would she have to take to, when she completes that next semester, be at a 67% completion rate? Because she's already going to be on a warning. Truth is, I don't even know. Uh, I think it's something like 24 hours. And... Uh, that's beyond, we're only supposed to allow students to take 18 credit hours during a term. And the fact that she wasn't successful at 12 it would mean she's not likely to be approved for 24 hours. So, so she's on warning. Unless she takes 24 hours, she's not going to reach her 67%. Where did it go wrong? It went wrong at the very beginning when the, the first initial thought of withdrawing entered her brain. And so how can we help this student? We have to explain this to students right from the beginning, the very first day of class. Here's the date to withdraw. We put that in all our syllabi, but yet we have to say that first day, if you do withdraw, you're likely to, to run into problems with uh, the completion rate and the maximum time frame. Uh, those are two things that cause all sorts of problems for our students. Uh, they, will, they have to go then on uh, termination. The first semester, this girl would receive a warning. If she didn't, she didn't pass 24 hours, the next semester she would be receiving a letter of termination. She will have the uh, right to go to a very kindly group of uh, faculty and staff for an appeal process. Uh, but still, it's a, it's a daunting and frightening prospect for her. So the best thing is, is would be much better for her to complete those courses. In most cases, it's better to get a D than to withdraw. In most cases, sometimes when there's a GPA question that's uh, very complicated, it might be the different scenario. But in most cases, better for students to get a C or a D than to withdraw, uh, because eventually those withdrawals will come to uh, catch them. Here's some information. I like to throw out a bunch of reports. And this is uh, a 2013 report uh, from the uh, uh, a peer group that we're involved with, I think uh, 268 peer groups of Ivy Tech. And it said that Ivy Tech uh, medium income for the East Central region is at the two percentile, which means that 98% of other community college students, their households have more income than our students have. That's, that's dramatic. And the challenge is uh, usually, 
uh, income and college success go hand in hand. So right from the beginning, uh, it's going to be a challenging scenario for our students. But also, I think it's a great place to teach because that's a place where you can make the most, most difference. <clears throat> you can break that, that uh, scenario, uh, or at least help to break that in partnership with the student. Another issue here was, is that the percentage of our uh, students who uh, the course enrollment success in, um, was 6 percent percentile. Again, that means that 94 uh, percent of uh, community college students across the country did better in individual courses than our students. Here's another factor that might relate to that. The, the percentage of our students who take their total credit hours or take significant hours uh, online is at the 91 percentile, which means only 9 percent of students in community colleges across the country, 90 percent of 9 percent of those students have more online credit hours than our students do, and that that creates a problem because usually there's a lower percentage of, of completions online than face to face. So we have a lot of things that between our our, um, our low course completion rate, our poverty rate, our extreme use of online uh, modalities, uh, that's going to create challenges for our students to be successful. And, in truth, the first time full-time degree-seeking student completion rate were at the third percentile. So our final result is as you would expect if you looked at all those demographics. Uh, well, why do students fail? Why do students withdraw? Why do they stop attending? And uh, my little sermonette to students, uh, probably too, uh, too obvious, is that uh, if you come to class, complete your assignments on time, the likelihood of success are very high, very high. But why is that so challenging? Uh, or why do students not, not, are not successful? Well, if you look at this, this, these next two slides are from Peter Adams, who is... Uh, famous for his work in, in co-requisite remediation at the Community College of Baltimore Common. And he said, he's an English teacher. For a while he thought, oh, they just don't know how to write a thesis statement, or they just, they just have challenges with their subject-verb agreement. And, uh, and he found out that wasn't the problem. The problem he found out is uh, students have too much on their plate. They have a, a job, or they're worried about their... Uh, their family life, their single parents, and having to juggle many things. Uh, they believe that they're not uh, college material. Actually, a student told him that. And he wondered, well, where did the student hear that? Well, probably heard it from some high school teacher or some grade school teacher that told this person he or she was not college material. So his point is that it's not so much the mechanics of the English language that were causing his students failure. It was these life issues. It, it was the it was this uh, mentality that students have that they weren't worthy or couldn't get better or didn't have the knack for college that combined into what he would call non-cognitive issues. Uh, and I, I agree with this. I think, yes, the content's important, but when you come to a community college, you're teaching uh, students that uh, that deal with these realities, both uh, family life issues and these affective issues. And to be successful, uh, one cannot ignore them, and one should address them head on. And I do think there's a, a, a chance here to be not only great teachers of English and, and uh, help students to help those uh, subjects and verbs agree and build a powerful thesis statement with lots of supporting evidence, but change the way people think about themselves and to be cognizant of the, the many uh, challenges that they're facing outside the classroom. So I would commend to you uh, a couple of things. There's a couple uh, links here that if you have time, maybe uh, in this session or maybe uh, at home, to read about uh, or to, to view these, these links about the growth mindset. Some of you may have seen the book by Carol Dweck, uh, the mindset book. And if you don't have one, I think uh, if you talk to our good friend and, and great leader, Jeremy Brown, he will find one for you at a very reasonable price, which is free. 
And also thinking about the whole idea of a metacognition. What, do sh what should students be thinking about the thinking process? Uh, I believe we can make a, a change. We've got some data to suggest that with the right uh, environment, with the right input, we can increase the chances of students to have a, a better result with their, uh, uh, their own personal uh, beliefs about themselves and about their potential to grow their brain, grow their intelligence, and to be more successful through perseverance and, and good strategies. All that should help uh, eliminate or at least reduce this challenge that the students find themselves in when they withdraw or they in, get in some other academic problems. So again, I, I uh, celebrate your being here. I commiserate with you for having to listen to this this lecture uh, through uh, through video rather than in person. But uh, I uh, suggest that uh, if you can have some sort of interaction amongst yourselves to think about some of the implications of what we've talked about. And, uh, and by all means, do your best to encourage students to hang in there, not to give up at that first sign of trouble, but to understand the implications for quitting and the benefits for being resilient. Thank you very much.